In contrast to direct imaging, for example with a CCD camera on an optical telescope where the physical boundaries of the image and the pixel scale are set by the design of the camera, an interferometer like ALMA or the JVLA samples the power spectrum of the sky brightness distribution. This power spectrum is equivalent to the Fourier transform of the sky and is usually called the UV plane by radio astronomers. This difference means that the sizes of the image and the pixels, or cells, are chosen by the scientist rather than being dictated by the physical size of a detector element, like a CCD. While these choices might then seem arbitrary, they are actually constrained in ways that may not be obvious. So how do you choose your image and cell sizes? At first, these seem to be free parameters that you can choose as you wish, though the usual advice is to make your image big enough to cover the field of view and the cell size is small enough to well sample the angular resolution of the image. But what does this mean? And what is big enough or small enough? To understand optimal choices for cell size and image size for ALMA, let's start with the concept of the field of view of an interferometric image. Each individual antenna in the array is sensitive to an area of sky defined by its own antenna response, called the primary beam. The field of view is defined as the full width of the single antenna response down to half of its peak intensity. In other words, the full width at half maximum, given by the 1.13 lambda over d relation, where lambda is the wavelength of the observation and d is the diameter of the single antenna. As you can see here in this overlay of the Galaxy M100, the field of view varies with the wavelength, with the longer wavelength band 3 having a larger field of view than band 6, and a significantly larger field of view than the still shorter wavelength band 9. Field of view depends on diameter as well. Here's what the field of view of almost 7 meter antennas at band 3 looks like. Notice that with a smaller antenna, the field of view is larger than it was with the 12 meter at the same band. Have a look here at how the 12 meter field of view changes smoothly with frequency. On the slider, we show where some of Alma's lower frequency bands overlap. As implied by the primary beam antenna pattern, it is of course possible to image beyond the nominal field of view. The antenna does detect power beyond its half power point, but with diminished sensitivity. Here's what the antenna's sensitivity actually looks like for a given field of view applied to the image. As you can see, the response of the antenna degrades significantly beyond the half power point. Often, we want to image targets larger than our field of view, such as M100, shown here from an ALMA observation. To do this, we have to combine, or mosaic as it's called, different observing directions, called pointings, together so that the whole area to be imaged is measured with uniform sensitivity. Now let's have a look at cell size. Remember that a radio interferometer like ALMA doesn't directly image the sky. Instead, ALMA measures visibilities in the UV plane, which are related to the images via a Fourier transform. Thus, image size and cell size are both closely linked to the UV plane sampling. Most digital transform algorithms require gridding of the UV data. The UV grid has cells of size delta U and delta V in the U and V directions, centered on zero. Image data are also gridded into cells of dimension delta X by delta Y, akin to pixels in a CCD image. The spatial dimensions of the image produced are simply these cell sizes multiplied by the number of cells in each axis. Note that these dimensions are distinct from the size of the image, the image size we talked about before, which is referring to the number of cells across the image. If we change our cell size, then we need to remember that the side length, the spatial dimensions of the grid, are being changed as well, and that therefore we may need to adjust the image size to compensate. Due to the Fourier relation, scaling in one plane is related to the scaling in the other. We only need to specify the parameters in the image plane, and we have then made choices that apply to the UV plane. 
The image cell size is proportional to 1 over the UV side length. Reciprocally, the UV cell size is proportional to 1 over the image side length. The image and UV grids always have the same number of cells. Thus, it is important to make choices that are appropriate both in the image domain and in the UV domain. Take a moment to watch how the grids change as we play with the parameters. The highlighted parameter is being changed directly, and those with a yellow marker are being indirectly affected by that change. We see now that it is important to choose cell sizes in both the image and UV planes to adequately sample the data. Making the total imaged area too small results in large UV cell sizes. Similarly, making image cell sizes too large effectively makes the UV grid too small. Also, notice that changing the image size does not actually change the side length of the UV grid. If you feel the need to contemplate this animation more, we've released it separately from this video along with several other graphics. There's a link on screen which you can also find in the description. Take for example the case of two point sources. The Fourier transform of these is a sinusoidal pattern in the UV plane. We know intuitively that our image will need to encompass both point sources in the image plane and adequately sample the sinusoid in the UV plane. What do we mean by adequately sample? In this case, all of the signal is in one sinusoid, which must be at least Nyquist sampled, otherwise the signal will be aliased. Aliasing arises when a Fourier sum is made over inadequately sampled data that are regularly spaced because phase changes of 0, 2 pi, 4 pi, etc. cannot be distinguished, manifesting in a wrapping or repetition of the signal. Nyquist sampling requires at minimum two UV cells across the sinusoid, which corresponds to an image size that encompasses both point sources. Say we were only interested in source A and decided to only image a small area around that object. Shrinking the image grid will result in larger UV plane cells that no longer Nyquist sample the sinusoid signal that is still present. The impact of these larger UV cell sizes will be copies of source B appearing in the mapped area at the wrong location. This is why a good first choice is to make your map size cover the full field of view in order to understand the distribution of sources in your image. Remember, however, that the field of view is just the half-powered beam width of the primary beam, so aliasing may occur even if you have imaged the full field of view, if a source of sufficient brightness lies outside the imaged area. In such cases, a mosaic to observation may be needed to ensure that sufficient sky coverage is made to avoid aliasing issues. We've examined the impact of the total image size on the UV cell size. Now let's look at the impact of the UV grid size on the image cell size. At this point, it is useful to think about the construction of an ALMA image in terms of individual baselines or pairings of antennas. Thinking about the contribution of each baseline in terms of a double slit experiment, we know that each of these baseline pairs will contribute a Fourier component of a sine wave determined by the orientation and separation of the two antennas. The scale of the finest ripples that contribute to the map arise from the longest baselines. It is these ripples that provide the highest resolution. The resolution of the image, that is to say the synthesized beam, is in fact inversely proportional to the longest baselines, acknowledging caveats such as weighting choices.
That's why when choosing a cell size, it is important to choose a value that well samples the synthesized beam. Again, what do we mean by well sampled? It is important to select an image cell size that will at least Nyquist sample the beam profile, the narrowest Fourier component, and ideally slightly oversample it. Based on empirical analysis, the standard recommendation is to choose a cell size that allows for five to eight cells across the narrowest component of the beam. Let's look at a real life example of a protoplanetary disk, a common target for ALMA observations. For this observation of J1604-2130, which we'll call J for short, we can overlay the field of view on the image plane because we know the wavelength of the observation and the diameter of the antennas used. We also know the UV coverage for the observation. When we select an image size and cell size in T-Clean, we can envision this grid covering our sky image. The angular size of the imaged area is just the cell size multiplied by the image size. We know that we need to choose a cell size that doesn't undersample the beam, and ideally oversamples it by 5 to 8 times. The size of the synthesized beam depends on weighting choices, but a good estimate can be reached by taking the ratio of the wavelength and the longest baseline. The result is in radians, so don't forget to convert to arc seconds by multiplying by 206265. In T-Clean, let's set the cell size so that the beam is 5 to 8 cells across. Next, we should set the image size so that the imaged area fills the field of view and adequately samples the UV plane. You might have noticed that much of this map is empty. We can zoom in to the center of the image to see the disk more clearly. You might even be tempted to image just J itself. Here we have two images. On the left, we see a good image of J, with a large enough image size and a well-sampled beam. On the right, the beam is still well-sampled, but the imaged area is just what you see here. There is no catastrophic aliasing, but because our image side length is much smaller, we have larger UV cells. This effectively lowers our UV resolution and sensitivity because data points are moved further during gridding, and the result is some flux spilling over outside of the ring. Another temptation would be to increase the image cell size to speed up computation, but if we do this, then the beam is no longer well sampled. What's more is that the image on the right doesn't really look all that great. We realize this is a lot of information, so here are some key things to remember. Set your cell size so that you have 5 to 8 cells across the narrowest component of the beam. Set your image size to cover the field of view, at least. And be aware that sources outside of your image can be aliased into your image in the wrong place, even if you choose your image size well. Know the area you're imaging in order to prevent this. Thank you so much for watching. We hope this helps people better understand the imaging process. Have you seen our other videos? There are some links to some of them up on screen now. Good luck with your imaging, and we'll see you soon.